Дмитрий, тогда можно, наверное, начинать, да? Запись. All right. Uh, hello. Um, and today we are continuing um, the, uh, our series of lectures on stylistics. And uh, last time we discussed, it was before your practice, last time we discussed um, lexical stylistic devices. And um, uh, today we are moving on to the next level in the language, to syntax, as you remember, phonetics, lexicology, grammar, and specifically we are speaking about syntax today, which has to do with the, with the sentence, with the roles of <clears throat> members of the sentence. And um, uh, we are going to regard the different syntactical stylistic devices, which are based on the violation of the word order, uh, on the violation of the completeness of structure, uh, either as, uh, well, incomplete structures or vice versa, superfluous structures, and finally, repetition, and the different types uh, of repetition. Um, and first comes... Um, oh, yeah, sorry. First comes um, uh, the block of figures of speech uh, based on the word order. And here we're going to look at foregrounding, inversion, detachment, and parenthesis. Uh, foregrounding, inversion, detachment, and parenthesis. Um, I'll just wanted to remind you that on the syntactical level, we speak of stylistic devices as figures of speech, right? On the phonetic level, they're mostly called phonetic instrumenting. On the lexical uh, level, they're called tropes, tropes. And on the syntactical level, they're mostly called figures of speech, figure rich. And before we speak about the uh, different uh, stylistic devices, which are based on um, the word order, on the violation of the word order, we have to say a couple of words about foregrounding as a concept. Well, there are uh, various understandings of the word foreground, and here I wanted to go back to the primitive, to the um, uh, very direct sense of the word foregrounding, which means to bring to the fore, bring to the foreground, bring into the limelight, into the spotlight. Um, and foregrounding is something that we do with uh, the words or our ideas when we want to emphasize them, uh, and therefore we bring them to the front. Here, when we're discussing the syntactical stylistic devices, it's most literally bringing them to the front of a grammatical construction, of a syntactical construction. Uh, it is uh, also based on the cognitive um, uh, phenomenon of salience. Salience means vipuklist. Uh, we notice salient features more than others. So when we sp uh, speak of salience in the verbal, in the linguistic sense, it is something that we notice or we are made to notice um, first thing. Usually the accented, the marked, um, the marked uh, position is uh, the first position in the construction, be it a sentence or a collocation. So the first word usually catches the limelight. So the first position in the construction is the strongest one. Um, this is a famous example of, uh, from uh, Raman Yakapson, which he quoted from some um, piece of literature, where he said, uh, well, uh, Two characters speak. One of them says, why are you saying Joan and Marjorie and not Marjorie and Joan? And the other one says, well, because it sounds better. Well, if you tr try to pronounce it, Joan and Marjorie or Marjorie and Joan, you will see that Joan and Marjorie is, is better pronounced than Marjorie and Joan. And this uh, foregrounds, this word Mar uh, Joan, also, it is uh, well. Mm, it is well known that if we, if you say, if you enumerate things, it's better to uh, take the short things first, right? Like Joan and Marjorie, because they sound. It's then, then your enumeration sounds better, right? From the short to the, uh, from the shorter one to the longer one. Um, this is uh, well, sort of canons of uh, aesthetics. And then uh, also in our everyday, day-to-day -day speech, we, you will see that for other reasons, we also highlight some words. For example, 
Uh, my brother and I, this is something that you learned in your grammar classes, that uh, you don't usually say my family, and, uh, I and my family, I and my wife, I and my brother. You say my brother and I, my family and I, my wife and I. Why? One of the reasons is because you sort of give the limelight to the other person, right? And therefore you act in a modestly, uh, in a modest way, in a gentlemanly way, uh, right? So you, you say my, my brother and I, that puts you second. And this is a good thing in terms of, uh, in, in ethical terms. Uh, the same thing happens in ladies and gentlemen, right? This is how people started to address the audience from maybe 18th century, uh, and then especially in the 19th century, giving uh, the limelight to the ladies, right? Ladies and gentlemen, this is where the ladies are in the limelight. And then of course, um, uh, priming, um ranging things uh, also reflects your uh, even even bigger things it, re it reflects your point of view which reflects your identity for example uh, in today's newspaper if you read about ukraine and russia or about russia and ukraine you can get who sympathizes who right or uh, maybe who lives where uh, so if people write ukraine and russia that means they sympathize or that they side with um, uh, Ukraine in this conflict and Russia and Ukraine vice versa. Uh, and uh, if you remember, we uh, discussed that uh, stylistics, I wanted to say it again and again, that stylistics is the um, uh, branch of linguistics which regards the language, regards language as an object of art, right? Um, and uh, we constantly draw parallels between other spheres of art and linguistics. And um, this, this picture illustrates very well the concept of foregrounding in its most literal sense. That's where the linguistic concept of foregrounding comes from, from painting, right? What is foregrounded here? It's this strange of the woman, right? All the rest blends into the uh, background. So we notice this picture in the foreground uh, better. Now, inversion. Inversion is one of these uh, figures of speech which help us to foreground things, to bring them to the um, foreground, uh, or not necessarily. Here in this um, slide, you see uh, examples which are not about foregrounding, rather. Uh, they're about other uses of inversion. Uh, inversion is, uh, inversion may be typical of colloquial speech, as you see in the first example. If if, uh, if somebody asks, your mother is at home, this is clearly a um, colloquial style, because grammatically uh, correct, it would be say, is your mother at home? Is your mother at home? Uh, on the other hand, inversion is also capable of elevating the style. For example, if you put the um, noun or the object and then the attribute, then it sounds like epos, right? Like uh, some epic story. And then it sounds vice versa. It sounds more formal than the other, the, the normal um, word order. He had McCassins enchanted. This is from Hiawatha, I think, by Longfellow. Uh, so instead of enchanted McCassins, fairy tale McCassins, we have McCassins enchanted. This sounds more like epos with fingers weary and worn, right? With tired and worn out uh, fingers. And again, this imitates this high flown style. So inversion is capable of uh, lowering the style, turning it more into the colloquial one, and vice versa uh, is capable of elevating the style to the epic style. Uh, inversion is also used for foregrounding things, for uh, attention grabbing, for uh, emphatic purposes, so for logical or for emphatical reasons. Uh, inversion helps us to foreground things. Uh, inexplicable was the astonishment of the little party, so of the, of the little group of people, right? Inexplicable, neobjasnimi. Uh, what is the syntactical role of inexplic inexplicable? It's the predicative. Right? So we often foreground the predicative. The astonishment was inexplicable. A good generous prayer it was, also the predicative, right? But expressed by a noun, nounal group. Rude am I in my speech. This is a famous example. I am rude, right? Rude am I in my speech. 
Um, often, uh, inversion is also used to to express concession, right? That although something is uh, like this, but yet, so rude am I in my speech, but talent Mr. Mikorba has, capital Mr. Mikorba has not. This is a uh, all too frequent situation, don't you think? People having talent and no money. Um, and the, in this case, talent and capital are uh, both have the roles of uh, the object, right? Direct object. Mr. Micawber has talent. Eagerly, I wish the morrow. That's from Raven by um, Poe. Uh, eagerly is the adverbal modifier of uh, manner, right? How I wish the morrow. My dearest daughter, at your feet I fall. The adverbial modifier of place, right? I fall at your feet. In when, Mr. Pickwick? Sometimes it's just the uh, second part of the predicate, right? In this case, the preposition, this postposition, postpositional particle. Um, preposition. Uh, patience you must have, my young Padawan. This is, you probably recognize it from the Star Wars by Yoda. A and in this case, you see that inversion helps not only to foreground things, it can also uh, serve characterization. In a way, it can create a distinct, unique style of a character who you remember by this abundance of inversion, right? Um, and if you just remember that uh, his style sounds so strange, right? It is because of inversion. Mm, uh, the well, next solicit device is mm, detachment. Detachment. Abasobilne uh, construkcja. Um, well, when do we detach things? Uh, usually it happens in um, in the living speech, right? In the colloquial speech. Why? Because we think in a linear way. We don't know beforehand what we will come to in the, at the end of our speech, right? So we uh, uh, portion out, we give out information by portions. And sometimes, very often, it is not as logical as it would be in a logically perfect sentence, right? Because you remember some things first, then you remember things that you might, should have said earlier, then you remember things that you um, leave for, 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 the, uh, for later, right? And they have, so our living speech, um, uh, well, functions like this, right? You uh, deal out information by portion. And that's what detachment does in writing, right? Detachment does this in writing. When you detach some idea, usually because you want to, again, to emphasize it, or because you imitate colloquial speech and the natural stream of, of speech, right? So this is what detachment uh, very often is for. I want to go, he said, miserable, right? This is the secondary part of the sentence which is related to the subject, he, miserable, but it comes much later. Uh, you can use various um, you know, punctuation marks to detach things. It could be a comma, a semicolon, and a dash, um, even a full stop. I have to beg you for money daily, right? You detach this adverbial modifier of time to emphasize it, right? So it could be logical emphasis. It could be imitation of the uh, colloquial, colloquial speech. For example, in this example from The Guardian, I love taking photos of my children, full stop. Not because I'm obsess obsessed with sharing them on social media or anything like that, right? This is a clause which we detach, uh, we start with because, uh, to imitate colloquial speech. And this brings the author closer to the reader, right? If you, uh, if you um, divide your sentence, um, it is easier to understand in this, well, uh, it's easier to grasp the information, right? And in this case, it imitates this colloquial style. Some more examples. She admired her husband, strong, brave, and victorious. Instead of saying strong, brave, and victorious husband, which would be the uh, dramatically correct uh, order, we say, we say it like this. Uh, um, then, what else can detachment do? It can also serve as the medium to convey um, uh, the direct speech, right? Again, 
he told her his age, 24, his weight, 10, 10 stone 11. Well, stone is apparently the American way of uh, weighing things like kilograms. Right? His place of residence, not far away. Right? So the detached parts are, uh, well, signal that this is direct speech. Uh, it can also uh, give um, sort of a summary, right, or an image, usually in the form of an apposition. Do you remember this grammatical concept of apposition? Приложение. Um, uh, Richard, the famous English football player, right, or uh, Francis, the famous English pirate, uh, apposition. Uh, the back window of a house has been torn out, allowing a view directly into the bedroom. A museum piece of life before the hurricane came. That's, yeah. Uh, apposition, yes. Well, grammatically and punctuationally, it is um, not always. Sometimes it can be, it can come before the noun. Like the famous uh, English pirate Francis Drake. Um, so this is from uh, an article about the uh, the aftermath of uh, the Hurricane Irma in the United States, which describes, gives this b a vivid image of the bedroom which was not devastated by the hurricane uh, when everything else was uh, around was um, torn and twisted and, uh, and broken. Uh, and that was like a museum piece of life before the hurricane came. So it gave us a glimpse into what it looked like before the hurricane. Now, if we draw a parallels with other forms of art. In this case, I think architecture is a very nice example of a detachment um, of, of, of an area where we have detached constructions. For example, um, in this building of a church, you have a detached construction, which is a bell tower, right? Um, it is a detached construction, but it is still not fully separated, right? It is the same building, but a separate detached part. Or, uh, this is an example of the Astankina estate. Uh, where are the detached constructions? Tell me. Left and right, the wings of the building, right? In English, they're called the wings. In Russian, they're called fligili, right? From the German word. Uh, so, the Deta detached parts of the building. Now, um, our next stylistic device is parenthesis. Parenthesis is a subtype of detachment. And um, as you saw, detachment can come at the, at the beginning of the uh, construction and at the end of the construction. But it can also uh, um, come in the middle of the construction. Right? It can be inserted inside, uh, breaking the sentence into two, or and breaking your thought into two. Um, parenthesis. He had been nearly killed, ingloriously, in a jeep accident. Right? And this ingloriously is the parenthesis. Now, we also detach it, not only with the help of punctuation, but if we pronounce it, with, we detach it with our tone. Right? Killed ingloriously in a jeep accident. Uh, I discovered disconnecting, however briefly, was like closing the door on the outside world when it gets too noisy and hectic. Uh, this is a, a sentence from an article about disconnect, the benefits of disconnecting and unplugging, which is uh, on the agenda today when so many people are constantly connected to the internet. Right? And disconnecting is uh, the activity which many people have to uh, engage in um, nowadays. So plugging, unplugging from the devices, from the social networks and everything. And that was the article about the benefits of disconnecting. Disconnecting, however briefly, no matter how briefly, right? How could John, with his heart of gold, do such a wicked thing? Uh, well, various punctuation marks for the parenthesizing things are here in front of you. So it could be commas, could be brackets, parentheses, and, and dashes. Our family, my mother, sister, and grandfather, had a barbecue this past weekend. And then she would ask him, what was his name, to bring her some more books. Well, this last sentence also shows us the characterization through 
shows us characterization through parentheses when she doesn't even remember the name of the man who brought her books. What was his name? Right. Um, so uh, parentheses embeds, well, inserts another idea. Uh, it could be as long as, an, as a sentence into um, the initial stream of thoughts, right? Embeds another idea into the first idea, or oh, thought into the uh, into the first thought. And this is a visual example of parenthesis. This is a um, the famous house with a shark in Britain. Uh, yes, you see that there is this yes row of sentences. There is something um, of a different kind it gets parenthesized in the middle of this entity. Now, we are done with the block of uh, figures of speech which were ba based on um, the word order. Once again, to uh, recap it, it was foregrounding, um, inversion, detachment, and parenthesis. Now, um, on we go to the completeness of structure. And uh, here we deal with ellipsis, break in the narrative, and suspense. I, um, uh, I, I insist on, on this pronunciation because this is the right pronunciation. I checked it multiple times, although everybody calls it suspense, in Russian at least. Um, so, ellipsis, break in the narrative, and suspense. So, ellipsis. Here on the right you see the, word, the Greek word from which it is... Um, well, from which it is the, the Greek word which was borrowed uh, into Latin and then into English. Uh, it means leaving out, blotting out, ellipsis, blotting out, ellipi, leaving out something, erasing something. And ellipsis is a figure of speech when you omit, drop um, the predicate, the subject, or both. You omit or drop the predicate, the subject, or both. That's why it is based on the completeness of structure, right? We play with the completeness of structure. In this case, we make it incomplete. And of course, ellipsis is uh, typical of colloquial speech. That's how we uh, speak very often. And here are the examples. Been there already, right? Have you been there? Uh, so have you is dropped. Being the only part of the predicate is left. Uh, been there already. Up, lazy thing, said the queen. Right? I think that was about the griffin in Lewis Carroll. Uh, so, uh, everything, right? Uh, oh, the predicate itself, the notional verb is missing. Um, and of course, ellipsis is a good medium, uh, is a good means to um, convey the colloquial speech, uh, the, the colloquial character of the speech in writing. So if you want to make somebody speak uh, naturally, you use uh, ellipsis. Um, also, it is used for, uh, well, uh, one more example for this colloquialization. I'm a horse doctor, animal man. Do some farming too, near Tulip, Texas, right? Do, I do. Well, but ellipsis is also good for uh, logic, for logical things. Uh, it's also good for um, clarity of what you say. So to avoid uh, redundant repetition of something, you can use ellipsis. And I'm not, I'm not giving the examples of, of the grammatical ellipsis, which you're familiar with, of course, when you just drop the repeating predicate, or you, you drop the repeating preposition or something. This is the normal thing. But here we deal with uh, also with with bigger uh, texts. Well, for example, ellipsis is used also on the signs, on official documents, especially with the uh, in connection with the general trend for simplification of syntax and uh, colloquialization of the written speech. This is one of the modern trends in English grammar uh, that um, written language is um, slowly adopting well, various uh, features of the colloquial language. Uh, one of them is the simplification of syntax. Uh, for example, if you look at this um, sign uh, on the English trains, uh, you see that it used to be much longer. 
the use of this rack, rack is sort of stand for your baggage, right? The baggage rack, that's where you put your um, suitcases. The use of this rack for heavy and bulky packages involves risk of injury to passengers and is prohibited. It's a very nice, correct, long English sentence with everything there. Then it gets shortened for, for light articles only, right? No predicate, no subject, just the main new idea. Uh, or for example, the traffic signs, uh, please drive slowly. Then we drop polite and say drive slowly. And then we just drop drive and say slow. Which of course is more memorable. It's easier to notice, right? It's easier to, to catch with your eye. So there is sense in this. Uh, ellipses can also be used in uh, fiction, and this is a famous example from uh, Shakespeare, from Macbeth, when Macduff says that when he hears that all his family and servants have been killed by Macbeth, all of them, he says, all my pretty ones, did you say all, O oh, hellkite, all, what, all my pretty chickens and their dam at one fell swoop, and this at one fell swoop, is this classical example of ellipses because there is what well, well, what is missing is he killed them all at one fell swoop одним броском and here this uh, ellipsis serves uh, to convey um, his feeling right um, his um, um, state of being overwhelmed with emotion his surprise or, for example, this one, when you also want to uh, create an unusual effect, you can elide things. Uh, each kiss, a heartquake. In Russian, it doesn't sound so much as, as ellipsis because we have we regularly have ellipsis. We drop the link verb, right? But in English, it is felt. Each kiss is a heart, a kiss, a heartquake. Um, ellipsis can also be signaled, and very often it is uh, signaled by three dots. When you um, skip something and then you continue, um, it can also convey your reluctance to mention something, or again, your the state of being overwhelmed with emotion. Oh well, he's gone to a better world. Did he peacefully? What is missing? Die? Did he die peacefully? She asked. Right. Uh, and one more, uh, well, one more area where ellipsis is um, widely used is the so-called telegraphic style, which you are familiar with from school, right? When you just mention the subjects without predicates, or vice versa, you just mention the predicates without the subjects. Beauty and the Beast, Loneliness, Old Grocery House, Brooklyn Bridge from Fitzgerald, right? Or, for example, Malay Camp, a row of streets crossing another row of streets, Mostly narrow streets, mostly dirty streets, mostly dark streets, no predicates. Um, does it remind you of any classical Russian poem? Noj ulitsa fanari aptieka. Right, right. This telegraphing style. Now tell me which slide I'm going to show you next. Uh, I'm going to show you a parallel in the vis in visual arts. Tell me what type of paintings is similar to this telegraphic style with ellipsis? No. When you only get the objects, abstractionism or, <laughs> well, uh, even more classical, still life, right? Nothing happens. It's just, noch ulitsa fanari aptieka, right? That's uh, the lemon, lemon, salmon, uh, and a jug of water. Still alive. Now, our next statistic device is break, or this difficult Greek word is pronounced in Russian as apisiopisis. Uh, in English, in Greek, it is apisiopisis, and in Gre in English, it is aposiopisis. Apo, please put down the transcription. Aposiopesis. 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 And now all together. And louder. 
and more energetically. And still louder. And finally shout. Excellent, excellent. Uh, it comes from the Greek word which means silencing. Covering with silence, right? Episode pieces. Covering with silence. Uh, it is the figure of speech when you break your sentence midway and don't finish it. You break the sentence midway and you finish it. What are the reasons why people uh, sometimes break their sentences midway? They forget what they wanted to say then. They give no comment, but they started it. No more context. They realize it is inappropriate very well. They realize they they uh, yeah. They are they are, they are being interrupted, of course, right? They are being interrupted, and then finally, when they want the others to guess what they want to say, or when it is clear what they want to say, it's clear what they want to say. So uh, there are there are some cases of trite episode pieces, the ones that we are used to in our in our everyday speech. For example, the famous phrase "it, it depends." It is in essence an ep a break, right? Because you have to finish. It depends on blah blah blah. But you just say it depends. So it is episode pieces. Good intentions, but that's also a frequent cliche. It means that you had good intentions, but um, what you did is no good, <laughs> right? Um, and this is a well a useful construction for to convey your indignation or anger of all the in nonsense I've run to. Right? Uh, literally means of all the nonsense I've run to, this is the worst one. Of all the cheek uh, I've I've uh, come across, this is the worst example. Right? But you don't finish. And this is an example of how it is used in context. Doesn't anybody in the whole house know where my coat is? Six of you, and you can't find a coat that I put down not five minutes ago. Well, of all the... What do you think he wanted to say? Of all the what? <laughs> no, no, no. Of all the stupidity of all of you, idiocy. You're all idiots, that's what he's saying, right? Uh, you can find my coat. Um, then, well, it's also used to, again, to imitate colloquial speech, for example. He bought this idyllic cottage in the middle of, uh, well, nowhere. Right? Again, that's what so is, there's something inappropriate. Uh, or, for example, it can, again, signal, um, it will refer, uh, refer us to some unpleasant prior event, for example, in this example, uh, sorry, for example, uh, from uh, Fitzgerald, uh, when he describes everything, everything was going so well, and then one fine morning, and we realized that something went wrong. And um, this is, the next example is from George Bernard Shaw, a play uh, where a lady steals Napoleon's private correspondence, his letters, and then she's caught and she's brought to Napoleon, he says, please give me back uh, my correspondence. And she says, okay, I'll keep one letter to myself and I'll, I'll give you the rest. Let's make a fair division. And of course this, well, uh, fair division, it enrages Napoleon. How could there be an, a fair division of his private correspondence? So he goes, a fair de right? He's overwhelmed with uh, indignation. He was shouting out that he'd come back, that his mother had better have the money ready for him. Or else, that is what he said, or else it was a threat. I not you, right? I just work here, he said softly. If I didn't, uh, he let the rest hang in there and kept on smiling, right? And we have to guess from the context of this um, novel what would uh, have happened uh, if he hadn't been working there. And this is again a famous episode piece, so I decided to include it for you, like uh, the one from Macbeth. This is from King Lear. I will have revenge when King Lear um, uh, is threatening his daughters, I think. I will have revenges on you both, that all the world shall... I will do such things, 
what they are yet I know not, but they shall be the terrors of the earth. Right? Я с вами такое сделаю, что... And then he doesn't finish, right? Leaving his threat hang in the air. Now, one more stylistic device, which, as I uh, said earlier, is frequently mispronounced in Russia. It is suspense, uh, something that we are used to calling suspense in Russian, uh, or retardation, is when we delay the resolution, the syntactical resolution of the sentence until the very end. But of course, suspense can uh, in, exist on many levels, including the level of the plot. And that's how detective stories are um, structured, right? They are all based on suspense. When you give, when you uh, mention, you 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 uh, show some crime at the beginning of the story, and then you keep the reader waiting for um, the logical end of the story to find out who the culprit was until the very end. And uh, well, but uh, on the syntactical level, it can exist uh, with the help. Well, it can be created with the help of a sequence of clauses, subordinate clauses, when the main clause comes at the end. Please raise your hands who knows uh, if by Kipling. Not all of you, not all of you. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to play this in a second, um, recited by a famous British poet, uh, actor, Michael Caine. Uh, but this is a really nice poem. I advise you to look at it closer to, to maybe even to learn it, uh, because this is such a such a brilliant poem. Um, so it the whole poem is a series of clauses. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you but make allowance for their doubting too. So there is the series of pedal constructions and antithesis and finally it comes to the main clause. Your, if you can do all this, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. Uh, and now uh, we're going to play it. Dmitry, can I ask you to turn off the stichtvarenie? <clears throat> uh, raise your hands who knows this poem by heart. You learned it very well. Good. But not all of you, right? If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowances for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet, don't look too good, nor look too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same, if you can hear the truth you've spoken twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools or watch the things you gave your life for broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools, if you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at the beginning and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are done and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 40 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, You'll be a man, my son. 
Well, you see, this this is the uh, suspense, right? If, 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 and only finally comes the resolution. Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. A brilliant papa, don't you think? Um, now, another example of suspense from um, uh, in prose. Um, and here there are um, several two uh, clauses with how many? How many pictures of new journeys, of a pleasant country, of resting places under the free broad sky, of rambles in the fields and woods and paths not often trodden? How many tones of that one well-remembered voice? How many glimpses of the form, the fluttering dress, the hair that waved so gaily in the wind? How many visions of what had been and what he hoped was yet to be? rose up before him in the old, dull, silent church. So why I included this into this block of completeness of structure? Because unlike break and ellipsis, which shorten the structure, suspense vice versa, extend it, extends it beyond the normal size, right? We make it look longer, extend it uh, longer than uh, is necessary, logically. Now, the third block will be about repetition. And here we'll deal with enumeration, uh, parallel constructions, and repetition proper. Yeah, repetition proper. Um, so, what is repetition? It's clear, right? It doesn't require a definition. Repetition is repetition. It's uh, similar to rhythm. Do you remember when uh, we discussed that the rhythm is at the heart of, uh, basically at the heart of people, right? Because our heart beats with this rhythm. And there is the rhythm in uh, how we live. There is the rhythm in how nature works, right? There is this constant change of things. And um, in a way, the, it makes repetition one of the most powerful stylistic devices. But we'll start not with the repetition itself, we'll start with enumeration. Enumeration, perichislenia, and uh, enumeration is a repetition, but it's uh, not the repetition of the same thing. It's the repetition of the same kind of thing, right? For example, we can enumerate nouns or adjectives or, uh, uh, or adverbs, right, or verbs, and they must be paradigmatically related, right? Not syntagmatically. Uh, so that's the repetition of paradigmatically uh, similar things, objects or activities or actions. Uh, this is a famous example of enumeration from Martin Luther King's speech. We will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual. Uh, and here we have this enumeration. It's actually quite complex, right? We have three sets connected with and, six different things. Черные, белые, евреи, язычники, протестанты, католики. And by enumerating things, he wants to show us the fullness Right, that all manner of things, these and these and that and those and these, right, they will all be united. Uh, if you, if we speak of the visual equivalence of enumeration, this is a series of, uh, can, could be a series of portraits. For example, this is a fragment from the famous painting by Ivanov, the uh, showing of Christ, the uh, Christ uh, shows himself to to the people, and these are all apostles: Apostle John, Apostle Peter. One of the is Jacob, probably. And uh, what makes this enumeration? They are all apostles, but they are all four of them um, unique personalities. They're different, right? You see the young, the old, all of them have different facial expressions, right? So this is an enumeration in pictures. Now, a special type of enumeration is a triplet. At the beginning of our lectures, we discussed that um, a stanza may be uh, formed uh, as a triplet when there are three lines. But here we speak of an enumeration in a broader sense, or of a triplet in a broader sense. Any three set of things uh, can be called a triplet. And it is often used in enumerations because it was noticed long, a long time ago, uh, basically in antiquity uh, and even probably earlier than that that if you say three things, 
this is the mo the optimal number, right? This is the best number number of things to say, uh, both aesthetically, it sounds good. Secondly, logically, because it's neither too too little nor too much, right? Uh, and this is like the optimal number, and especially um, if it is um, uh, finished with and. One, two, and three. So if you want, want to make your enumeration beautiful, uh, it's better to say one, two, and three. Uh, but it is it could be a tri-triplet. They are all over us in our everyday speech. We say, oh, blah, 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 right? Or yeah, 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 right? This is also a triplet. Um, uh, then, of course, in the famous phrase, veni, vidi, vici, I saw, I came, I, I, I came, I saw, I conquered. Our highest priority will always be education, education, and education. Uh, politicians like to use enumeration uh, as well as lecturers. Uh, but in this case, Tony Blair, uh, I think he stole something from Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, right? Uchitsa, uchitsa, and еще раз uchitsa. And uh, it is also used in advertising. For example, um, after buying this product, your life will become easier, better, and more fulfilling, right? Three good things. Three good reasons to buy this product. And visually, of course, triplet is everywhere, uh, especially in, um, uh, in, in architecture, um, you know, where it again gives us a completeness, st stability of structure. It's symmetrical, so it is in all in, in various ways uh, aesthetic an aesthetically pleasing thing. This is a Roman triplet. Um, now, two more types of enumeration, which uh, I'm sure you're familiar with from your um, seminar classes. These are asyndeton and polysyndeton, or asyndetic enumeration and polysyndetic enumeration. enumeration. Uh, so, uh, enumeration without conjunctions and enumeration linked by conjunctions. So, have you leisure, comfort, calm? Where does it come from? Men of England, right you are. With plow and spade and hoe and loom, this comes from the same part, right? Um, uh, and in this case, the closest uh, parallel from other arts is from music, of course, right? This uh, march and waltz, leisure, comfort, calm, or plow and spade and hoe and loom, right? This is again, this is a waltz-like uh, rhythm, and uh, well, which is created by polysynthesis. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I can go back to Martin Luther King. Both, both at the same time. And it also, it's also a triplet, do you see? Black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, you see? I told you politicians like, like triplets. Um, I think you will, uh, sometimes when I uh, read lectures, I also, I also catch my th myself thinking that I'm using triplets. Um, well, this is uh, one more example of enumeration, which will bring us to one more type of enumeration. And this is a poem uh, from, um, I think it is Alice Through the Looking Glass, uh, of the walrus and the carpenter. Oh, no, that, I think that's a song from Alice in Wonderland. This is sung by Griffin and, and Mock Turtle. Um, that's a sad, sad story. Do you remember they were, that they were friends with oysters, and finally they, um, they took advantage of their naivety and, and, and at them. A uh, very sad story. Um, the time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax and cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot and where the pigs have wings. And um, this is one more type of enumeration where we enumerate uh, things which are, on the one hand, they are the same part of speech, but semantically they're very widely, they're wide apart from each other, right? And this creates another effect. Well, here we have cabbages and kings, right? Absolutely different things. This brings us to uh, enumeration as accumulation. Nagramajdenia. Piling up of things. When you intentionally use very heterogeneous uh, things in your enumeration, and the effect that you want to achieve is, is uh, well, the kaleidoscopic character 
of, uh, of the picture in front of you. You intentionally want to show this kaleidoscope uh, to your listeners or to your readers so that you get this uh, in a feeling of confusion, a feeling of disorder, of hurly-burly and uh, hectic, um, something hectic. This is from Goldsworthy. He reached each new place entirely without hope or fever and could concentrate immediate attention, and here, of course, this is I ironic, on the donkeys and tumbling well bells, the priests, patio patios, beggars, children, crowing cocks, sombreros, cactus hedges, old high white villages, goats, olive trees, greening plains, singing birds in tiny cages, water cellars, sunsets, melons, mules, great churches, pictures, and swimming grey-brown mountains of a fascinating land. It shows us the impressions of this young man who comes to, I think it is Spain, although it looks more like Me Mexico, uh, of this new land, and that describes the feelings of a traveler. Remember last time when you traveled. If you travel for a long time, uh, or, or if, when you travel to a foreign country, uh, and you see a lot of things, it becomes like a kaleidoscope, right? You, you, you see all things and too, too many impressions. This is the visual analogy of what, uh, yes. Uh, yes, please. Peter Bruegel, right. Yeah. Uh, wait, wait, I'll give you the uh, mic so that you are heard on the lecture later on. I talk with this too. Uh, so, uh, there's the picture of Peter Brugge, the elder, as far as I remember, from a Flandrian artist. Was he from Flandria? Yeah. Uh, this is the depiction of uh, Flandrian connotations. Uh, a lot of phrases are depicted here. For example, the pancakes on the roof and uh, just resembles, as far as I remember, user section. So, Every action depicted here, however, whatever useless it is, is just a connotation, it's just a phrase which is very, very used in Netherlands language. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. This is, uh, I think this is called Dutch proverbs, right? Dutch proverbs. So the, the, these are the proverbs which are visualized uh, as, if, as if it really could happen. Yes, but it gives us this, uh, thank you, Andre, for the commentary. Yes, and I think it is a good parallel to what um, accumulation is, right? This is the gallery of things which are disorderly and, and confused. Now, uh, next stylistic device, uh, which is uh, independent from enumeration, but often happens in conjunction with enumeration, is gradation or climax. Uh, it can be independent, of course, because it could, could exist uh, on the level of text, it could be, exist on the level of a plot, where things grow, and usually that happens so, right? When things grow more tense or they, they grow more emotional uh, as time progresses. Uh, but it, can, it is also very is frequently realized in an enumeration of things. A sequence of ideas or sentences that grow in significance, emotional strength and expressiveness, and very often in, in enumeration. It comes from the Greek word, which you see on the right, uh, climax, which is translated as a staircase, a ladder. Right? A staircase, something that you climb. And gradation basically means the same, because grade means a staircase. Um, he was not a bad listener a good speaker and an amazing performer, right? Again, a triplet, but with a gradation. Not bad, good, amazing. For that one instant, there was no one else in the room, in the house, in the world, besides themselves. It's slightly hyperbolic, but still, in the room, in the house, in the world, each new container is bigger than the previous one. Little by little, bit by bit, and day by day, and year by year, the Baron gained power. Uh, the next sentence describes the process of house hunting. If you've ever engaged in this activity with your parents, you may recognize some of that. They looked at hundreds of houses. They climbed thousands of stairs. 
they inspected innumerable kitchens. I think this is the text that you read in your Arakin textbook, if you uh, did Arakin in this. Yeah. No. Oh, that's from Arakin. Um, right. Well, the visual parallel would be a structure like that, right? Coming in grades, the this um, uh, mausoleum of uh, Lenin. Um, actually, it was made after a very famous um, Babylonian buildings, Babylonian temples called zikurats, which were platforms, which were smaller platforms put on bigger platforms, and that's. Uh, uh, well, an outstanding uh, building in its own right. And then if we speak of um, uh, musical parallels, there is this uh, phenomenon of crescendo, right? When so when your the volume of what you play, of what you say, grows, and the, then you say something loud and loud and loud, and the reach, reaches the peak, right? This is crescendo. One more example, which I um, couldn't help but include here, was is the uh, illustration that's an uh, illustration, an icon of um, the book by John Climacus, and you can get you can guess that John Climacus means somebody who has to do with staircases. In Russian, it is Ian Lestvichnik, and he wrote a book which is called Lestvitsa, which means a staircase. And it describes the, pro the stairs, the steps of spiritual development. And each new, each new chapter describes a new step, a new virtue that you must, and then you get uh, higher and higher on this uh, staircase of spiritual development. And this is the, the icon which illustrates this with people going up the staircase and demons trying to pull them down from even from the highest uh, levels. Um, the opposite to climax is anticlimax, and vice. It, it describes the reverse um, process of gradual weakening of something. Um, the boat will be excellent on the ocean, on the sea, on the lake. That's the weak. The uh, size becoming smaller and smaller. But it, sometimes it is also about the sublime subjects and the low subjects. Um, Am I not in the way of your listening to your mobile? Um, Harris never weeps. He knows not why. If Harris's eyes fill with tears, you can bet it is because Harris has been eating raw onions. Right? So the word weeps implies some sort of tragedy or well, real, really serious matter. And then if your eyes fill with tears because you have been eating raw onions, that describes Harris as a very uh, callous person. Right? This is from uh, Three Men in a Boat. He was inconsolable for an afternoon. Он был безутешен в течение полудня. This was appalling and soon forgotten. Это было чудовищно. И быстро забылось. Right, so we have the strong and then weak. Strong and then weak. And this is a fresh example from uh, The Guardian, I think, or from The Telegraph. Lord Teviot was a hereditary peer who became a Brighton bus driver, right? This, here we have this anti-gradation the, on the social hierarchy, right? Being a hereditary peer and then going to work as a bus driver, as a modest person. And the musical parallel would be diminuendo. Right, diminuendo. When you say start saying something in a loud voice, and then suddenly, then your volume subsides, and you say something less. Right, diminuendo. The opposite to crescendo. Crescendo, diminuendo. Now, parallel constructions of parallelism is the repetition of the syntactical structure. Uh, sometimes it comes with the repetition of the word itself. And then we have an app for a for, but it can just be parallelism, where we have the parallel parallelism in the syntactic construction. For example, John kept silent, Mary was thinking. Subject expressed by a proper name, uh, auxiliary verb, and the notional verb. Right? The parallel, the structure is the same in every sentence, even though none of the words repeats. It is one of the most widespread stylistic devices in the whole of the world's literature. 
Um, uh, well, for one thing, parallelism is beautiful. For another, uh, it is also it also helps to make the structure of the text transparent. That's why it is used to structure the text. It is used to make it transparent, clear. So it serves the purposes of clarity, um, transparency, persuasion, and visualizing things. What you see is what you get. I came, I conquered, I saw, I conquered. And then, uh, well, parallelism often appears in the Bible. Uh, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Sometimes, as you see here, it can be accompanied by an aphora. What, what, I, 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 air, air, air. But uh, it could be just parallelism. Now, as I said, it serves the purposes of, uh, clari of, of um, clarifying things and ordering things, structural things. That's why it is so popular in lists, to-do lists, for example, right? And if you want to write an effective manual, you, you must use parallelism. If you use various, if you vary your syntactical structure in a list of things, it will make comprehension of your text uh, more difficult. It will darken what you want to say. If you want to be clear, use parallelism. For example, stuff for flavor, oil the fish, that's how you structure the different recipes. Manuals, how to work with uh, equipment, with devices. This is all based on par parallelism. Uh, it can also be used in to-do lists, as I said, and this is a nice example of a, a social advertisement that you, I'm sure you saw all of them. It is styled as a to-do list. Uh, but it, sh it shows us that people often think about many different things, but not about their closest relatives, right? That when you have some uh, planning meeting, then meeting sponsors, finally call on mom, and the note says, again, I didn't, right? No time again. Um, parallelism, of course, is one, is a stylistic device in which classicism is built. Classicism as a style, right? It is full of parallelism, full of repetition. Well, uh, unified structures appear everywhere. Uh, these columns, right? Uh, and um, uh, the reverse opposite of parallelism is chiasmus. 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 Chiasmus, and now please together, and again, and again, louder, and more, and shout, good, good. In Russian it is hiasm, comes from the Greek word hiasma, so uh, structuring something in the shape of a cross, in the shape of the Greek letter he. Reversed pedal constructions, where sentence members follow in the reverse order. Reverse order. So, for example, here we have, down dropped the breeze, the sails dropped down. Right? We have this adverbial modifier or this postpositional uh, particle to the word, to the verb, dropped the predicate and the breeze, the subject. And then vice versa, the subject the predicate, and this down. This is a, a famous example from Milton. Love without end and without measure, grace. Grace, blagadet. Uh, love without end and without measure, grace. So it is just to show you how they are uh, formed in the shape of a cross, right? Letter he. That's why it is called heasm, chiasmus, to explain the, the name, the term, right? See, love, grace, without end, without measure. Right? Is this clear? Good. Some more examples. Eat to live, not live to eat. Socrates. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. John Kennedy. Charm is a woman's strength. Strength is a man's charm. Right? Uh, well, I find chiasmus quite, uh, quite elegant, don't you think so?
Now, a uh, visual example of chiasmus. I, I struggled with finding a proper illustration, really. I'm not sure this one fits perfectly. But I think this is sort of reversed parallelism, right? You have parallel things here, and then the two other griffons facing from the other side, and they are like uh, mirror reflections of these ones. So it is mirrored parallel constructions, right? Chiasmus. Now, antithesis, you are familiar with antithesis, protiopostavlenie, from the Greek word antithesis, opposite putting, opposite setting, setting something opposite each other. It's direct contrast opposing ideas very often in parallel constructions. Uh, this one is from Blake, right? I was angry with my friend, I told my wrath, my wrath did end. I was angry with my foe, I told it not, my wrath did grow. And here we have one antithesis realized through three examples. Friend, foe, told, told it not, and, and grow, right? And of course, antithesis can exist not only on the level of a sentence, but on the level of a text, plot, and so on. But we'll maybe look at that later. Government, some more examples. Government cooperation are in all things the laws of life. Anarchy and competition, the laws of death. A soul, of full of a soul as full of worth as void of pride. Настолько полное достоинство, насколько же пустая от гордости. То есть нет много достоинства и мало гордости. Some people have much to live on and little to live for. Right? We have this direct opposition between much and little, and therefore live on and live for opposed to. Five difficult books that were, that are worth reading and five not to bother with. So it is everywhere. It can be, uh, it can convey deep ideas or just be ca a catchy, can form a catchy headline. Um, a visual parallel to antithesis uh, can exist on, well, I'm sure that we can come up with many examples, but this is a fragment from William Turner's um, the picture, the fighting Temeraire, uh, when um, a ship, the old type uh, with the sails, is towed, tugged, uh, by a tug uh, ship, which is already driven by steam, the steamboat. So the, the small, the front one, is the steamboat, and the back, the big one, the, it is the fighting Temeraire, the old warship. And we see here this antithesis between the new and the old, between progress and old technology, right? Uh, but also, uh, I think the critics speak about that, that there is this antithesis between the ugliness of the steam engine, right, and the beauty of that old warship. So all, all different types of antithesis uh, here. Now, repetition. Uh, we've come to it finally. Uh, repetition of individual items. It can exist on the level of morphemes. For example, this is an example, uh, this is root repetition. Shrink to your cellars, holes, and cells, right? Cellars and cells are not the words, it's just the morphemes, the roots which are repeated. Sometimes we repeat only the suffixes. Unfortunately, I forgot to uh, include this example here, but, uh, well, you can find this example yourself. When you just repeat the suffixes, the prefixes, and, um, uh, this springs to the eye. Uh, now, the different types of repetition, again, you are familiar with many of them from your practice cl practical classes, that's good, you already know what I'm speaking about. You remember some of that from your school years. And after a repetition of the beginning of a sentence or a line, my heart's in the highlands, my heart is not here. In the previous uh, class, um, a student asked me if it is anaphora or par parallelism, and of course this is both. Right? This is parallelism and anaphora. It doesn't, well, the presence of one doesn't make uh, the other not uh, actual. Um, epiphora or epistrophe, repetition of the end of a sentence or a line. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child from Epistle of St. Paul. Or, for example, do you remember the previous one? Uh, a, a Malay camp, a row of streets, uh, mostly narrow streets, mostly dirty streets, right? This is also epiphora. Framing repetition, repetition of an element at the beginning and at the end of a sentence. I find this one particularly elegant. 
uh, poor Sally, she must be so far away now, alone, miserable, poor Sally. And nowadays, uh, well, uh, if you read English newspapers, you will see that um, journalists uh, like this um, figure of speech on the level of the whole text. They start with one detail, for example, giving us a detail of some um, event, like a little girl who was uh, brought up in a, in a poor uh, area. And then they tell us about the different social conditions. And finally, they end with the um, with this girl who finally went to university or something and who is now prime minister. So something like that. They love it. And this that's really beautiful, right? Framing. You begin with one thing and then you end with the same thing. Well, some visual examples, right? Fra this is frame in the direct sense, right? Frame as a ramka. And this is the effect that framing repetition has on the text. And one more example of framing is another um, bridge in St. Petersburg, where the bridge is framed with the horses, right? The Anichko Bridge, where it is framed with the horses. Or the, in the previous example with the griffins, right? That illustration could also be used here. Uh, Anadiplosis, or catch repetition, or linking, or reduplication. It's the same, but you can use any of these terms. And the last word of, of, of phrase of one part of an address is, is repeated at the beginning of the next part. But what? My heart's, my heart's in the highlands, I chase in the deer, chasing the wild deer and following the roe. Where does it come from? Burns, my heart's in the highlands, right? Um, this type of repetition is frequently used in dialogues because this is the natural way dialogues flow. You finish with one thing and your uh, partner begins with the same thing, right? This is catch repetition. So, so typ it's very typical of dialogues and colloquial speech. Do you know that it's nearly nine o'clock, sir? Do you know what? I cried starting up, right? So he's pro probably overslept. But I still enjoyed it. I enjoyed the sense of being lost in the game. Uh, or this is this is a famous phrase. I'm not sure that this is the author who actually initially said it. Uh, hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men, and weak men create bad hard times. Right. So we have the circle of a structure where things go in a circle. Now, we still have some time to finish with these stylistic devices of drama. And uh, I will read it. If you're too tired, just relax. But I wanted us to record it. So rhetorical questions, question in the narrative, and represented speech. There is very little material left. Stylistic devices of drama. They are also related to syntax. That's why we are regarding them today. They, are, they, are, they also have to do with syntax. Uh, the rhetorical question is the question which uh, presupposes an answer. That means that you know the answer, you can guess it, or that there is no answer, and you know it. Um, usually, a rhetorical question is, is a question only by its form. By its content, it's usually something else. It's usually a statement. It may be a statement, a negation. It may be an imperative. If you remember to the men of England, you, re you remember what I mean that wherefore plow for the lords who lay you low, instead of saying, don't plow for the lords who lay you low, right? So what uh, Shelley is saying, he's giving an imperative to the workers, but he sh shapes it, styles it as a question. What have I done to, well, there are some trite rhetorical questions which you know from everyday speech. What have I done to deserve it? Well, the implied answer is, of course, nothing. Are you crazy? Well, that means you are. Right? Or you are not. How many times do I have to tell you to stop talking? A million times. Uh, why are you so intolerant? That means you are intolerant, right? Nobody knows. Uh, isn't that ironic? Of course that's ironic. What's the point of going on? There is no point of going on. What shall I do when you leave? I don't know. Right? These are rhetorical questions. Uh, uh, well, uh, this is an example from uh, The Guardian. The latest Google phone promises to transform my children into perfect smiling angels by different retouching. Why would I want that? So me, I don't want that. 
right? It can retouch, replace, and remodel all at once. I much prefer the fun and mess of unvarnished, nilikirovany childhood snaps photos. Question in the narrative is very close to the rhetorical question, but it doesn't presuppose a question that you already know. It's not a universal question, and it's not a question where, where you can say nobody knows, right? That's a question which, which the character in the book, the lyrical hero, asks himself or herself, right? And then usually answers. For example, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. That's what Shakespeare asks of himself and, and his uh, beloved one, right? Uh, he says, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Uh, probably yes. And then he says, it's not enough. Scrooge knew he was dead. Of course he did. That's from, um, yeah, Christmas Carol by Dickens. Uh, what is the opposite of faith? Not disbelief. Too final, certain, closed. Itself a kind of belief. Doubt. Right? So you, you ask the question, then you answer it. That's called the qu question in the narrative. Um, one more example. Let's skip it. Um, now, re two types of represented speech. There can be uttered represented speech. And then you can guess there will be unuttered or inner represented speech. He said, wouldn't be a good idea if they had another bottle of fizz. Fizz, champagne. And Nina and Adam said, yes, it would. So they had a magnum and got very friendly. So these words, which are highlighted red here, they were spoken, they were said. They actually uttered them. Right? That's, it's, that's why it's called uttered represented speech. It's not direct speech, but it's represented in the text. A maid came in now with a blue gown, very thick and soft. Could she do anything for Miss Freeland? No, thanks, she could not. Only, did you know where Mr. Freeland's room was? So these are the phrases that the maid and Mrs. Miss Freeland say to each other. Right? It's not, they are not marked with quotation marks, but we understand this is something they said to each other. And if you uh, don't say it, if you represent something that the character thinks about, it is called inner represented speech, which goes on in your brain. Over and over, he was asking himself, would you receive him? Would you recognize him? What should he say to her? Why weren't things going well between them? He wondered. Right? This is something that uh, people, well, something that they say to each other. They're in a conversation with each other, with themselves. Uh, she looked, she had not looked at him once since they sat down and he wondered, and then we get into his head and see what he's thinking about. What on earth she had been thinking about all the time? It was hard when a man worked hard as he did, making money for her. Yes, and with an ache in his heart. And we see this conversation, right? This is direct speech, but it's inside, inside him. That she should sit there looking, looking as if she saw the walls of the room closing in. Right? That's what he is thinking. This is direct speech inside his head. And uh, a specific stylistic device which is based on that is called a stream of consciousness. When it is all in a represented speech, but it is uh, close to what thing, thoughts look like in our brain. Or they are styled as if it is uh, the thoughts with, which go is in a continuous line. James Joyce is a classical and Ulysses an exam, a classical example of a uh, work where you have this um, figure of speech, this uh, device. I could have brought him in his breakfast in bed with a bit of toast, so long as I didn't do it on the knife for bad luck, or if the woman was going her rounds with the watercress and something nice and tasty. There are a few olives in the kitchen he might like. I, I never could bear the look of them in Abrines. I could do the cryada, the room's looks all right. Since I changed it the other way, you see something was telling me all the time I'd have to introduce myself, not knowing me from Adam very funny, wouldn't it? Right? Stream of consciousness. And, <laughs> well, since we are almost on time, well, just one minute, uh, syntactical ambivalence. This is an add-on 
bolt on and extra. Uh, when uh, syntactical ambivalence is based on the multiple ways of syntactical interpretation of the sentence. And you get different interpretations and readings because of the syntactical valences of words. What kind of animal can jump higher than a house? All kinds. Houses can't jump, right? Jump higher than a house. So a house jumps or higher than a house jumps. Call me a cab. Sir, you are a cab. Not call to me a cab, but call me a cab. We're having your mother-in-law for dinner tonight. I'd rather have chicken, right? Uh, to have for dinner means to eat or to greet. And uh, um, uh, well, the, these are ones that um, you can study at home. Flying planes can be dangerous. The shooting of the hunters is terrible. There are two ways of understanding this. Uh, two are from Russian memes. В Вернгенском кабинете делаем только срочные переломы means that you make x-rays. Дети выдаются отцам только в трезвом состоянии. Дети в трезвом состоянии или отцам в трезвом состоянии. And finally, this last one is an artificial phrase. Приглашение рабочих бригад вызвало осуждение товарища Иванова. It has, it has a specifically constructed thing, a specially constructed phrase, which has 32 different interpretations based on different syntactical valences by Yuri Drinikich Aprisian. So this is called syntactical ambivalence, and this brings me very luckily to the end of my lecture. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, you no, know, puns are very often based on syntactical ambivalence. It's the, um, something which lies at the bottom. Можно выключать запись. Спасибо.